<laughs> look, look, the dynamic duo. Well, listen, guys, welcome to the dynamic duo. I'm Franz. I'm Kevin. Welcome back to the Bat Cave and Avengers Tower, everybody. Kevin, my friend, today I am so absolutely excited because. We've had the privilege to talk to some really great people, but I don't think you can get greater than our next guest. I mean, we are talking about a Hall of Famer. We're talking about a man who is responsible for creation of characters like Wolverine, Luke Cage, Carol Danvers, Ultron, Vision. We're talking about a staple, the first editor that followed Stan Lee. We are talking about none other than Roy Thomas. Roy, please welcome to the show. Oh, I'm happy to be here. I'm glad we could get together here. Even if we're how far apart are we? Where are you, where are you coming from here? So we're in Maryland. Oh, we're Maryland. Maryland. Yeah, we're haven't been Maryland. to Baltimore Con in quite a few years. I remember I enjoyed those cons back there. I've I've, yeah. I've done Baltimore Comic Con for years. Yeah, they they have a nice little con down there, as I recall, from being there once. With the, and they have it on the water side and the walk there. Is yes, sir. There. I enjoyed that very much. Yeah, I have to come back sometime. So the first question I always like to ask, since we only have an hour and we have a lot of questions, um, the first question I always like to ask is, for you, do you, do you have a, an understanding and appreciation for what your work has meant to people like me, to the fans, and how it shaped our lives, and how genius, and how it impacted us? Do you have an appreciation for that? Well, first of all, sounds like an over-evaluation to me, but thank you. But <laughs> But the only way I can, you know, uh, uh, relate to it, because I mean, I was just doing this, doing the work, making a job, trying to earn some money and have a good time. And so forth was, uh, is by my own feelings toward the people, you know, that, that whose work influenced me, you know, comics, I mean, also movies and other fields. But when you think about comics, I mean, you know, to me, you know, the people that, that I knew before I came in the field at all, uh, you know, um, certainly Joe Kubert was way at the top of the list. Sure. Um, Jack Jack Kirby was at the top of the list. You know, as, as a superhero artist, I really liked him better than anybody. But Kubert was an artist I liked in certain ways better. But Kirby was the greatest. I liked, you know, I liked Ditko. I like, uh, I'd gotten, you know, really liked Stan. Uh, you know, Stan's writing from the beginning in the Fantastic Four, a name I barely knew, Stan Lee from <laughs> My Friend Irma comics in the fifties or whatever that I saw, and. Uh, it meant nothing to me when I saw it on Fantastic Four. You know, by an issue or two later, it meant a lot to me because I saw this is the the writer. And although I knew about Kirby from Simon and Kirby, Stan had meant nothing. But you know, I, and, and the other names that the people that meant a lot to me in the field, uh, especially were uh, Gardner Fox, as the co-creator of the Justice Society, Hawkman, etc. Um, twice with Hawkman, and um, the uh, and Julius Schwartz in particular, who was the editor who you know helped bring back the flash and justice league and justice society even and so forth and and they were you know they were really instrumental people in my career first in getting both gardner and julie schwartz had a lot to do with my getting involved and ended up doing alter ego back in the early 60s and then of course they became, right. to some extent influenced me on as a professional probably would have even had more to do with me if i'd stayed at dc but you know i respect them very much and there were, you know, names like that, uh, Carmine Infantino on The Flash, Gil Kane, you know, and so forth. And this is before I was seeing any really good work by Gil Kane when that Green Lantern, it was so stiff, but it was, you know, and I didn't realize how good Gil really was. And, you know, other people that I had seen, some of them I didn't know the name, but there were names that kind of forgotten almost now, like a Mort Meskin, you know, who had done such a wonderful job on Johnny Quick and uh, Black Terror, Fighting Yank, and so on. So when I think of the, the impact these people had on my life, for me to meet Julius Schwartz, for me to meet Stan, for me to meet uh, uh, Gardner Fox and have dinner at his Yonkers home with him and his wife kindly inviting me up, and, you know, and Otto Bender, the uh, very nice guy who was then writing Superman, but who had been one of the major writers of Captain Marvel, you know, some of the very best Captain Marvel stuff, and was such a nice guy, invited me to his home you know, uh, over the weekend, uh, right at the first week or so after I moved to uh, New York, but also people whose work I just really admired. So in that sense, I can kind of understand. I don't, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not like a, a, I don't consider myself like a front, front line, first, first rank, you know, creator, you know, but uh, like, you know, like Stan and Jack and so forth, maybe second, third, fourth tier. Okay. You know, but <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> well, I absolutely <laughs> consider you a frontline creator. Absolutely. The body of work 
and the impact that you've had. And in fact, we have questions to ask you uh, later on about that impact. But it, it, I promise you that you are first line and whatever feeling you may have had meeting a Stan Lee or is quadrupled with us meeting you right now. I mean, well, I'm not as co colorful. Meet, meeting Stan is a whole experience in itself. I mean, there's no way more powerful <laughs> from the moment you meet him from, than Stan was, you know. You know, guys like Kirby, they're much more laid back and you just talk to him, Bill Everett, That's John Romita. Stan, I mean, it's like, you know, it's like meeting Mer Milton Berle or something, you know, like, <laughs> you know, Robin Williams or somebody like that. You know, that kind of but, so forth. He's, gonna, all, he's gonna, always on, you know, when he's with anybody. We're going to ask you about Stan later on because I really want to get your perspective on, on, on Stan Lee and just, how, you know, his impact on the industry. But we'll ask about that later on. First, so you started early, obviously. As a kid, you were a fan of the genre. And I know that, was it through a fandom that you got to work with DC? How was that? How did that develop? How did you get to work well, it, to become a professional? It, it was really a multi thing. Uh, as much as it, it, it the, the fanzine helped because I was sending uh, a, a magazine, I would send it to as many professionals as I could. In particular, people at DC, I had more names and addresses there. I, you know, I only had one name, like Stan at, at, at Marvel. I didn't know any addresses for Jack Kirby or others. I would have sent them. So I, we'd send a few of two, you know, and Jerry Bales before I would send copies to them. But mostly it was, it was through that. And that's how they got to sort of know my name, my name for things. And because, you know, I was putting together a fairly professional looking magazine back in 64. Uh, the the two, which is the first issue I ever published of Alter Ego, number seven. Wow! Uh, I only had two, seven and eight before I moved to New York. The last one, you know, had didn't come out until later because I had finished it right before. But uh, as as much as anything, it had to do with the the letters that I wrote too. You know, it was a combination. And of course, then they also had that whole uh, magazine that I had done. But but it's also the letters, letters to. Again, Julie Schwartz and a lot of exchanges with Gardner Fox. They never read it up in letters pages, but you know, we, we exchanged a few letters a year, and a lot with Julie, not all of which were printed, certainly. And, uh, you know, a few other people. I got into a good correspondence by 64 uh, with Otto Bender, and I learned a lot about comics, you know, because he wrote a good letter to Alter Ego, which I published and got him in trouble with Mort Weisinger as editor because, I, because he said he, he liked writing Captain Marvel a lot better than writing Superman and Mort Weisinger was angry about that. You know? <laughs> but it was true. Of course, he wrote better Captain Marvel than he wrote Superman because he was, you know, and, uh, you know, so it was, but it was the letters. Stan had seen only a handful. I only wrote a couple of letters to Stan, but he'd seen, but he'd seen that. I think, I think what's, so it was really my writing the letters, doing the fanzines that got me to kind of DC because Mort yeah. Weisinger had seen the magazine. He knew Julie Schwartz, who had been a childhood friend of his, knew me. And evidently, he went up to Julie one day uh, in early 65 and said, uh, you know, uh, what do you know about this? Well, as Julie told it to me years later, said, uh, he said, what do you think of this guy, Roy Thomas? Uh, I'm, you know, <laughs> and uh, I, I saw this name. He, I'd written like one letter to him about a Lois Lane story that had a monster drawn by Kurt Schaffenberg that I, I love because it reminded me of a Captain Marvel story. Is why I wow. <laughs> Which I think I mentioned in the letter. But anyway, so he he so so he told uh, Julie uh, that he was, you know, about, what I asked him about. He says, well, he's written a lot of letters to me. Uh, he's, a, he's a teacher, you know, right away. I, you know, he feels I'm literate and all that. I'm, he's an English teacher. And so, so you were already an school. adult by that time. You were already oh, an adult. When I got in the field, I was 24, pushing 25, yeah. Oh, As, in, okay, fact, gotcha. in fact, the first professional I ever met, Wendell Crowley, who in the 40s had been the editor of Captain Marvel and the Marvel family, the later Mr. Mind stuff from then on to the end, he, uh, he had gone back into his family lumber business after Fawcett folded. So he traveled to St. Louis in business. So in early 65, about the time I, I had just accepted the job, it hadn't come yet. I, I skipped school to, to meet him and have a pizza. I was always willing to skip school. <laughs> uh, <laughs> except I was the teacher so you know but I uh, so I didn't skip as often as I would have liked to but anyway so we went off and we had a pizza place uh, up a, an hour away in St. Louis my favorite pizza place and I was telling you he says oh you're getting to the field he says yeah how old are I said well I'm 24 he says you're an old man so we were all teenagers we, we were 17 18 19 we, and of course Kubert was like 12 13 when wow he was you're kidding he, no wow. I, when he first do what was it Bolton or whatever he was like 12 or 13 by the time he was drawing the bright time, he was drawing Hawkman. He was already like late teens, you know. But I oh mean, my that was, God. he had several oh years career already. He was a real prodigy and uh, doing professional good work. And uh, 
So, you know, uh, so I, I, he considered me a latecomer, but I was, you know, 24. So I already had four years of teaching behind me in Missouri by the time I accepted that job. Thank you. But, uh, Kevin, did you have a question? Did you want to follow up? Actually, uh, uh, yes, Mr. Collins. I have to ask, uh, since your background is teaching, uh, did you ever get to a point where you used your work in comics within your uh, teaching background and your classes? Not much. I, I think I mentioned this, you know, the fact that I was interested in old comics because there were a few articles about it coming out you know, in the early 60s, middle 60s in that year or two. And one time I remember I was, uh, before I had a job in comics, right before, no, I, I had accepted the job in early 65, but I hadn't, you know, but I couldn't mention it yet. But there was a, a columnist at the St. Louis Post Dispatch who, because of the fanzine stuff, contacted me about, and he did an article on me for that, uh, for the St. Louis Post Dispatch, which was the biggest, you know, St. Louis newspaper. So I brought in my, a box of my all star comics, you know, which is my <laughs> most valuable possession. And, and, and there's a picture of me sitting there at my desk, no students around, but sitting there at my desk because he interviewed me at the school, I guess, or something, or at least he had this picture. And, uh, took this one picture of me with proudly sitting with my box of all-star comics, you know, and uh, they sort of knew, but I never brought that in much because first of all, it wouldn't have been as respected then as it might be now, you know, yes. even by, by the students, by the administration, by anybody. And, uh, but even when I was, became a teacher briefly for one very unhappy nine month period in, in 1999, 2000 at a school here in South Carolina, uh, a mistake by my wife, pushed me into thinking I might enjoy it, but I, I could have told her I wouldn't, and I didn't. But anyway, uh, but, you know, they sort of they sort of knew I'd had this career, you know, and so forth. One or two kids were kind of interested. Mostly, I, I couldn't see they were interested in anything except wrestling and causing trouble. But, That's so I fascinating. Really, so I didn't deal, you know, with I was starting to publish the new Alter Ego or, or to edit it, you know, for tomorrow when it was part of Comic Book Artist magazine during that period as volume two. And, you know, I had one kid or so I brought in a copy and he, he kind of liked it and so forth. But, you know, mostly they were kind of in, indifferent. You know, I could have come in, and, you know, unless I was a rock star or a major movie idol, it didn't mean much to them and they didn't mean much to me. And I just really, <laughs> as you can tell, I was not exactly cut out to be a teacher. It's just that I had no ambition. You know, all, I became a teacher because the local school, well, local, you know, nearby town, 10 miles away, Cape Girardeau, Missouri, was basically a teacher's college. Yeah, I mean, more than anything else, you could get a general education there. But, it, it, and I accepted a little scholarship to teach high school, uh, you know, very, very small. I paid tuition books and I had no ambition to move away. I was, I, I, was, I didn't even live on campus. I lived with my parents, 10 miles, you know, didn't have the money to live on campus, didn't care. All I cared about was uh, going to movies, reading comic books, reading lots of stuff. And uh, dating the, the 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 girl I was going with, you know, <laughs> all, all that. And that was it. That was it. I, I, that's why I didn't even try to get a scholarship to you know a major university, or even someplace in you know like University of Missouri in Columbia or something in St. Louis. You know, I didn't want to move away. I just want to keep on going to the movies and dating the girl. And you know, I became a teacher because well, I had nothing else I could do. But if I that was the closest I could get to staying, just have an excuse to read, I'd be at least teaching English and reading over a few books and. Turns out it wasn't nearly close enough. You know? Fascinating. Because well, I, I respect yeah. teaching a lot. It's a wonderful profession. Of but course. It just wasn't for me. So that, that means how cool must it have been then to be that guy who enjoys life? Um, and the, that's the way, and it was naturally artistic because those who appreciate art are, are artistic themselves. How cool must it have been that based on your letters, now you're sitting down with Mort Weisinger and Stan Lee's calling you on the phone. And by the way, how was it? Because we've heard some horror stories about well, it, Mort it wasn't, Well, Mort was awful, but the fact remains, it was a dream. I, I respected Mort as, a, per, as a, a talent. I mean, you know, he was really good. He could steal ideas from this guy and give them to the other guy, but he, yeah. he, could, he could write. He was, the, you know, the original writer of Aquaman, Green Arrow, things like that. Uh, he had a lot of talent. He just he didn't let that stop him from being a bastard, though. You know, wow. There were two wow. or three. The, the worst heard, people, yeah. the worst people at DC, and they were both talented people. Were uh, and I didn't. The, the other one I only met briefly, but I know uh, were Mort Weisinger, who was a real genuine sadist with his people, and the other who could oh be just God. as bad was was Robert Kaniger, who was also. I mean, he wrote. He's one of the three writers of All Star Comics, that my favorite comic book. But he was he was a real bastard, you know. And, uh, Best way in what sense? Like, was he just mean to you? Like, was he well, just like... Weisinger was just, yeah, 
why isn't he just browbeat and mistreated? I mean, he, he insulted writer's scripts. You wow. know, he, he, you know he, I, I don't even say on TV some of the things he would say he would do with the writer's scripts. Like to Otto Bender, a, chi- a young a childhood friend who had been the writer of Captain Marvel was writing Superman. The only guy I ever heard have a kind word for Mark Wiseman was a person, not even this old friend, Jude. Oh, no, I know we're freezing out. It was Dick Sprang, the great Batman artist, who had mostly worked from out of town. And he liked him. He's the only person I ever met, besides maybe Jude, <laughs> half the time, who liked Mark Wiseman. Uh, Robert Kaniger, I didn't know as much about. I was, I was working at DC. The first time I came into DC, I, I, went, I couldn't get paid, even though I told them I'd show up. And they said, okay. Then I showed up and they couldn't start paying me till next week. So I was hanging around anyway, doing stuff and basically right. working without getting paid. But what the hell, you know, better than teaching. And uh, so I, and one of the first things that happened is Kandiger, I hadn't ever even met him. He came in, introduced himself to me and started berating me because I wow. came from comics fandom, which of course is more part of the reason I was hired. But sure. he started berating me because somebody, he said it was Paul Gambaccini, the fan who later is, now is a big name on BBC radio. But um, he said he said that uh, Paul Gambaccini or somebody said, described me in a comic book as wearing a bow tie. He says, I will give $50 to anyone in this room. He was in a big production room at DC with a lot of pe- number of people in there and Murphy Anderson over in the corner drawings, Hawkman. And he says, I will give $50 to anybody in this room that has ever seen me wear a bow tie. Well, if anybody had, they wouldn't have said it at that stage. You know? yeah. <laughs> but this guy, the, the main thing I know about him, I wasn't there, but I knew this from many people uh, that, that, for example, the great Mort Meskin, one of the best artists in the history of the field, he had mm. kind of fallen evil times. He had some nervous breakdowns. He was drawing war comics and different things for Kaniger. And Kaniger found an excuse to make him get out. How would you, how do you, how do you get under barbed wire? Maybe crawl on the floor to show how to get under barbed wire. And it was, it wasn't because he needed to know or needed to see. He was just a writer who, who liked to humiliate everyone else, you know? Wow. There, there was, a, wow. there was a mean streak in him. I respect him as a, uh, he caught, I mean, he, I talked to him. He called me up at one time at 11 or 12 o'clock at night and kept me on the hour when I was here in South Carolina. Uh, so it was only about 30 years ago. Just and kept me on the phone. I said, I said, you know, it's a as mean a person as I ever met was Weisinger and Kaniger. And yet they were both people I respected. I'm glad that not all people in the field were like that. Most people were, you know, they're on a spectrum. We have our good days, we have our bad days, we have people that right. like us, we have people that hate us, and so forth. Weisinger and Kaniger were on the spectrum where very few people they respected him in the sense that he was a powerful force and even maybe respected his talent, especially Kaniger a little bit, but they knew what a bastard he was. The only people, but not like he, Kubert had a good relationship with him because he, Kubert said, if why, if Kaniger had ever tied the stuff on me, he tried that I heard on other people, so I'd have slugged him and he probably, <laughs> <laughs> little Kaniger, young knew, Kaniger knew he could, who he could push and who he couldn't push, you know? Wow. So what was the contrast like there for? And thank God you didn't get to work with them for too long because I think it was like eight days that you worked with them. So yeah, what was the contrast one like? One week and four in the next week, yeah. And, yeah, exactly. And, and so what was the contrast like working for Marvel and working with a guy like Stan? Well, night and day. And how did you figure out which one was day? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, Stan, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, Stan, like any of us, has his faults and he's got his things. And you know, he could be a, a tyrant or have a temper like any of us could and, you know, and so forth. But, you know, he, this is a guy who, uh, you know, he knew what he was doing. He was generally a friendly enough guy. He was professional. He, and he wasn't looking for an excuse to berate you, even Understood. if he didn't like something. You know, I never saw Stan just want to berate people for the sake of berating it or try to turn it personal. I you understand. Know, I never saw, you know, do anything personal like, like, like Weisinger or Kanagra would try to insult people personally. And, uh, you know, Stan was, in addition to anything else, of course, you know, he glad hand you. He was very much on, you know. I mean, he, this was at the beginning of his public persona. At this time, he, you know, maybe he'd done a college appearance or field radio, but, you know, he hadn't really been out in public doing much, but he took to it like a duck to water, you know. <laughs> and uh, he immediately developed this persona that, in some ways, of course, became a, a uh, you know, almost a parody of itself after a certain style. At some stage, it sort of goes into it's just too big, you know. Uh, Interesting. So I, but behind there, there was a real person that had something in common with that, who, if he wasn't really a comics fan, because remember, he, there weren't any comic books really much when he was growing up, you know, sure. and the one sure. few there were reprinted old comics. He came to work for Timely. I don't think Captain America number one was on sale yet, you know, wow. or else how he, he had been in number three two months later, right? But, wow. you know, that, that was the, the thing he would talk, because he was, but he did like comics. He read everything, and comic strips he loved. 
and he probably read a few comic books before, but you know, he just got in because what he, you know, it was a job and uh, he got in because of a relative by marriage and turned out he had a lot of, uh, he inherited the job because Simon and Kirby quit because the only reason he got his job That's and he right. turned out to be pretty good at it. So he stuck, you know, so he stuck around for the next few decades, you know? Wow. 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 And he deserved it. I mean, you know, he and, he and Kirby, to a lesser extent Ditko, but he and Kirby were the two, you know, great resident geniuses without whom Marvel, they couldn't have existed with Kirby, out with Kirby without that uh, Matt Marvel. Absolutely. They couldn't have existed without Stan. And anybody who tries to tell you that either one was dispensable is, has the worst judgment and don't buy anything else from these people because <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I couldn't agree with you more and there's that we'll talk about that a little bit later but there's that controversy about how much stanley meant but i couldn't agree with you more that that the, he played an integral role as much as you know as kirby and the ditko's uh and the foundation of, of marvel kevin did you have a question that you wanted to ask uh i i uh, must ask mr thomas when you were working on green lantern uh, it wasn't long. <laughs> it, 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 yeah. I, I understand, but um, you mean the two issues? I, do you mean the two issues I dialogued over more? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. First thing I did for DC that time. Yeah, yeah, right. Were there I mean, any changes that you would have made to the character? Well, those stories I was just, uh, you know, just dialoguing, so I didn't think much. That was just like one time. I liked that Green Lantern character. I didn't. Gil Kane's costume for him, I didn't think it was quite colorful enough, that green and black, but it was functional, you know, and I, I love the old characters. The, the old character had, the old original Green Lantern, right. had what I always call a church window costume. A church window costume, and this is not from the profession, this is back when I was still a fan, I thought of it as, it's, it's one of those that has so many colors in it, like a stained glass church window, you can't even know what to focus your eye on. You know, because it's he's got purple, he's got light green, he's got dark green, he's got red, he's got yellow, he's probably got white somewhere. He's got you know <laughs> his pale skin, he's got blonde hair. You know, and, and Hawkman, who's a great favorite character of mine too, was same way. All, a bunch of different colors: gray wings, red, yellow, green. You know, and the best characters, really, generally, uh, visually at least, are the ones that concentrate on one or two colors, maybe a little trimming, like Superman. You got red and blue, and a little yellow trimming. You know, you got Batman, yeah. so just gray and and uh, Green blue, yeah. plus wow, yeah. the stupid yeah. yellow belt. Why would a guy of the night wear a yellow belt? You know, <laughs> but anyway, let alone put a circle around the bat. But you know, you know, two or three. Well, somehow Wonder Woman kind of worked in spite of being a few colors. But you know, mostly the characters were good. And Gil Kane's costume, that green and black, was good and simple. I just didn't like it too much. But you know, the character himself was great. It was a wonderful version of uh, Green Lantern. They did a good job, Julie and Gardner and John Broom, reimagining those characters. When they brought them back in the 60s so i never thought you'd see the old 40s characters again because they had been superseded but thanks to as much as anything i think to letters that jerry bales and i and a couple of other people wrote julie decided to bring back the justice society too so we kind of influenced that and he brought it back in a whole totally different way than we ever would have imagined with the earth 2 thing no, i don't nobody ever suggested that to julie or gardner i don't know whose idea it was exactly uh, each of them thought it was the other guy's idea. Sometimes each of them thought it was their idea. I don't know. But together, <laughs> they brought that back with Carmine as the artist. And, uh, you know, it was a wonderful thing. But you just get but, good but, people. and you, you, you put these people in a room every day, and they got to hash out a plot. They got to hash out what to do with the character. They're going to come up with a lot of good ideas and a lot of bad ideas. You know, you that, remember that brings up an actually... Ideas. That brings up an interesting question. And what you'll notice is that I'm more the Marvel guy and Kevin is more the DC person. So our questions will be skewed that That's way. Okay. I'm both. <laughs> yeah, it, it, we're more Marvel, Marvel we're, of course, but I like both of them. We're uh, also uh, both. We're we, also both. Yes. Uh, yeah, in, we're in, also in, both. In, in, yeah. When I was young, you know, more DC, even though I yes. thought, you know, and in later Marvel, but I still love those DC characters and other companies too. You know, I like, I like a lot of stuff. As you do, I'm sure. One of the things that fascinates me is the Marvel way or the Marvel method. And the what, what I love is the continuity that existed within Marvel Comics. And I know you played a role in that knowledge and that continuity. So how did it work? Can you give us an idea of how, how that process worked? As a writer, how did you submit your plots to the artist? And how much did you communicate with them? And how did it work? Well, uh, not to go into detail on that, but as you know, it just evolved because Stan was the only writer the company had just about. Larry was writing, Larry Lieber's brother was writing, but Stan was the main writer sure. and he didn't have time to keep writing full scripts because that takes longer. But if he could type out a paragraph as an idea, you know, or a page or something and give it to a guy who knew story, who was a good storyteller, like Jack Kirby was, or it turned out Steve Ditko was, even the other guys could do it. Sure. 
uh, then he could then that because otherwise it wasn't a case that he was selfish or lazy. But if he had to stop and write a full script for a day or so for Jack Kirby, then somebody else, some other artist, Steve Ditko or Don Heck or someone has to be sitting on his hands and he's not being paid. But if he could just do a little plot and get him started, they could all get, be earning money, you know, while he does this. It was it was really a necessity of the fact that there was nothing left of timely Marvel comics except a little rump in the, in the late wow. 50s, in the 60s. Wow. And it just grew from there. So wow. but once once he did it, Stan discovered that it actually worked better than the old method. It wasn't like it, nobody had ever done that before. I mean, they did some of them back in the 40s. People did that, you know, sometimes. I think some sometime Eisner Studio did it on some stuff. And I heard other companies said they did it but the problem is it had totally died out i think you know uh, by that time and then stan kind of brought it back with his own twist just by necessity so by the time i got there the system was was pretty simple except it was different except it was different with stan and with me by the time by that time stan and someone would just be talking to jack for a couple of minutes That's and right. he would tell jack the villain he wanted or story or even jack might make a suggestion and then they'd talk for a couple of minutes and jack would go off and draw so obviously he's contributing if not, you, you can call it writing, you can call it, you know, drawing and, and co-plotting, but whatever you call it, he's contributing the story, but he's, but, you know, but of course it's always subject to what Stan wants or accepts because Stan was the one that if so, if something didn't sell, Barton Goodman was going to drive out to Jack Kirby's house and hit him on the head. He was going to get That's Stan right. <laughs> and, uh, and Stan was going to get me. So what the, the, the basic system after I worked out after, and I usually wrote the first issue of everything that had already been penciled from a plot by Stan and the artist, and then I just dialogue. But then by the next one, I would be writing my own. I'd write a page, two or three pages. I, I tended to write more than Stan did, you know, and, I, I, and everything uh, on there. To, uh, it still left room for the artist to do a lot of choreographing on fights and this and that, but the motivation, no dialogue, but the, uh, not usually not the title, but the, except on uh, even an Android can cry on one or two others, wow. but the, uh, but generally speaking, it would just be you know, two or three pages of the plot. It wasn't paced as far as pages, you know, page one, page two. It was just, you know, do this for a couple of pages and that and so wow. forth. Uh, later on, I had to detail it more as the editors got less inventive. But uh, uh, but in that day, and then I would say I would send it off to the uh, the artist, mail it off. Later, sometime I had to do it over the phone and tell him if it was an emergency or something. But but the, the idea was to do it in writing. The artist would uh, would get that job. He'd. Uh, he would pencil out, do the pencils from the thing. It's 20 pages or about whatever it was. It could be shorter or longer, whatever we knew. And uh, that he would mail it into the office or when I was working at home sometime, sometime it got mailed directly to me. The original art, you know, which was, you know, big, bigger than today's art. At first it was like, you know, <laughs> uh, twice up. Now it's not as much. Sure. But still, it's a big package to come in the mail. I can sometimes remember two or three jobs. I can picture, remember tearing open and seeing that art for the first time. The two I remember the best were the splash page of the first vision story for Avengers 57 and seeing that wonderful can... drawing of page three panels and a splash with the vision penciled wow. by John Cena. And I John remember the Sema. feeling I had when I opened Conan number four in from just come in from England by Barry Smith. Wow. And, uh, and, and the tower of the elephant, you know, so forth, <laughs> which described, you know, the way that I had, you know, I'd send him a synopsis for as well as the original story, but uh, you know, I can even remember, you know, those, and I got the, like the coder, and I remember lying on the floor of my uh, apartment there, you know, and I was just drawing the captions and balloons on to make sure that they were all like straight across the page and things wow. like that. So, you know, some, a lot of stuff I don't remember, but once the, pen, once the penciler had penciled the page, he threw them, sent them back to wherever, and uh, Stan would have to look at them in the early days, less and less as time went on, and he trusted me or whatever, but uh, he would, but, you know, and then I would take them home, and I, I never wrote in the office. Um, I, I, I Overnight or, you know, over the next day or two, whatever the system was, I would di write the dialogue. I would draw the balloons. That's, and when I say this, I'm saying Stan did basically the same thing that he's uh -huh. going to me. I would indicate exactly where the captions went, where the balloons were. I, you know, I probably made them a little smaller because I was trying to squeeze stuff in. Then they actually <laughs> would take out some of the letters hated me. Um, and then, you know, and I would, and, and, or if there was a little art change, I would, you know, maybe I'd just say, Inker, can you, you know, do this or, you know, can you change that just a little bit? I, you know, the Inker shouldn't have to do much because he's not being paid to pencil. Uh, if it was too much, I'd take it in the office or do something else. Tried to make, avoid making changes. Stan would make more. I was always trying to avoid them more than he was. But, uh, and then once it had been written, scripted by me, you know, had my type script and that and the art was set to the letterer. And the letterer would, you know, would put the stuff on 
and then he, and erase the part of the stuff that was behind the captions and balloons without erasing. I understand. The then it's sent on, either it's brought in the office or maybe sent directly by the letterer who got reimbursed or whatever, sent to the inker, generally speaking. You know, if it didn't have to go back to the office for some reason. The inker usually, of course, was not the penciler. And um, then he would ink it, you know, and he would erase the rest of the pencils behind. And sometimes a lot of those margin notes, and um, it's always good when you find that they weren't erased because then you can learn things. Sure. But uh, they had to erase at least the artwork and they sent it back in the office where it was then, well, the first thing would happen, especially for the first few years is, you know, it went to Stan directly. Sometimes even my stuff was first before anybody at the Stan wanted to see it, make sure it was okay by him. Uh, and he might be less than happy about something or other that <laughs> I did, something that the artist did or whatever. Sometimes he, he, he would be unhappy with something, but, but, but his basic thing, unless it absolutely was something that really bothered him, he'd mostly say, you know, don't do this again or do it differently in the future. Because if you start messing around with the story too much, it can take time. In the early days, uh, because I wasn't Stan, Stan would want to rewrite my stuff to sound even more like his. I mean, I was imitating him sort of to a certain extent anyway, but he would want to, so he would, he would let the thing, because he didn't have time to edit my scripts. He'd wait till it was all nice and lettered in <laughs> ink on the original art. Then the stuff comes back, lettered and inked. And then suddenly he would give the production manager, Saul Brodsky, a heart attack by saying, oh, we got to, he'd rewrite several hundred or a couple of thousand words in my oh my God. And of course, this is all <laughs> money and time because a, a letterer has to be brought in to letter it. It's not the same letter. It may not be as good a letterer. You can often tell these lettering corrections in the book. And Saul Bryce, he's, you know, he's got to get the book out of the code. And he's got, now he's got another day. And it you know, takes up time and space in the office, the two little rooms we have. So finally, after three or four months of my writing the hero books, you know, and, and just stand rewriting this and rewriting that on the, you know, on the beginning of Sergeant Fury or a couple of books or X-Men. Finally, after a few months of this, and Saul would talk to Stan as, you know, Stan, can you, we find another way? You're killing me. <laughs> and uh, finally, Stan calls me in front of Saul and says, you know, Saul's been talking to me about this and says, I know I'm just, sometimes I'm rewriting it because you did something wrong or because I really think you did. But sometimes I realize, as I think about it, that I'm, I'm just changing it because I would have done it a little differently. And I, I'm not changing it because it's my way is better. But I sometimes let myself just get into, I'm changing it just because I would have written it this way. But, you know, but, you know, you, so he said, so I, from now on, I've decided what Saul, when, when you, your work comes in, Saul is to bring into me the first page, you know, this is the original art, the first page and the last page. And wow. I'll read those. And if those two are okay, I'll figure what comes in between the other eight <laughs> pages are okay. And after that, we got along fine because I re he very rarely read anything I wrote, you know, wow. the first and last page. And after a while, I think he didn't even do much of that, maybe just the first page. What a great answer, because you covered so many things. In fact, you, you covered some of the questions that, that I was going to I'm ask. I'm for covering questions that people haven't even asked yet. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> you're, you're, you're a pro. So here's the question that I have there for. So you get the, the artwork based on your plot. Do you ever look at it and go, wait, no, this is not what I wanted. And what was it like? Did you have a fake? You know, you worked with some of the greatest mm -hmm. artists you know, in the in the field. You worked yeah. the Barry Windsor Smiths, the, 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 the Gene Collins, the, I mean, John Buscema, Sal Buscema. Yeah. I mean, you, you name them. You're the best right there. Yeah. Oh, my God. And uh, so but I, I imagine not all of them were the legendary um, artists. So the. Did you ever get the art and go, oh, no, this is not what I intended, and I prefer working with this artist? And who was your favorite, can you say? Well, there were obviously, you know, mostly, sometimes the artists would say, you know, mostly I, I would think they took it and did a really good job, or, or at least an acceptable job, because I knew the artists already. They were already professionals for the most part. Even the guys who came in new, like a Barry Smith, you know, uh, and everything. Uh, you know, his, like his first Conan, his, his early work was not so good. You know, it was like imitation Kirby Serenko stuff, but but there was there was, there was always that there. spark. There was always yeah. you know Stan saw from the beginning there was something in there, and so did I. I not right away, but within a couple of stories, well before Conan, Understood. I'm the one who suggested him for Conan eventually. Wow, and wow. Uh, you know, and even when we saw the first Conan, we, you know, he it wasn't like he's exactly in probation, but if the second issue hadn't gotten better, we'd have probably looked for another artist. But That's it did fair. because you know he because we saw enough stuff in the first issue, we had to a second, and by that time it was all okay, you know. Barry never even knew he was on probation. You know, we didn't tell him because <laughs> you don't want to make a guy nervous by saying, if you don't do better, we're going to around. But, you know, and of course he did because we knew he was good. You know, it wasn't yeah. like we'd have fired him. He would have just given him something else to do. 
Uh, but uh, it worked out well, and he got the job because he was cheap and in England, where we could, and we couldn't afford John DeSimma for that book. But anyway, uh, so you know, I, uh, but that happened often that I saw things I didn't like. Sometimes I could get little things redrawn, or Stan would want something redrawn. I might not even agree with him, uh, but I didn't argue. I learned very quickly you didn't argue too long with Stan. If you said something mildly, that's okay, and then he'll tell you why he did it. But if you come back a second time, he begins to get annoyed. <laughs> He's already given you his position. You know, interesting. And, uh, interesting. And everything. And he would, you know, he, and he kind of snap sometime and so forth and, you know, get, you know, get angry. But, you know, but mostly, you know, mostly we had a, a good relationship. And I learned, you know, that uh, you don't push him too hard. And besides, you know, hey, here's the guy who, as much as anybody, is responsible for this great, co you know, company, the success of the company. So just yeah. because I have a different opinion, God, you know, I, I can't automatically assume I'm right, especially yeah. in the younger days. And even if I'm wrong, you know, his viewpoint has got to prevail because he's the one ultimately responsible to the publisher for it. So, um, but and once in a while, yeah, I'd get angry. I remember I almost gave John Romita, who was art director, unofficially and unofficially, because right. Jim Colin did something probably in the Daredevil, some panel I really didn't like. And, you know, I was working with the original art in those days. It was in pencil, I think, not ink, but in pencil before I said inker. And I got so angry about something he did. I just took a, make a big X and oh, no. that panel, destroyed that panel. I wouldn't ordinarily <laughs> do that, you know, so forth. So that panel doesn't exist anymore in any way. Sure, I had it redone. But John, he couldn't believe because I, who liked these artists so much, I just, that I had, you know, totally defaced this panel. Stan would have done that a hundred times without thinking about it. You know, I, oh my I God, very rarely wow. did it because I was too intimidated by the, the talent. I, I said, gee, I, even if it wasn't what I wanted, it was a good drawing. You know, I, sure. I sort of wish I had cut it out and saved it. You know, you sort of later on, you're glad <laughs> for every throwaway panel that got saved because it's probably still a good drawing. But I, I uh, but mostly they did a good job. But you ask about favorites. I mean, you know, they're all the people you sort of think they were, and mostly we got along fine. Some of them I had great trouble with later, you know, and so forth. Some of them were always pussycats or whatever, or maybe they hated me and didn't tell me. I don't know. <laughs> the, my all-time favorite collaborator probably would have to be, uh, you know, uh, John Buscema. I was going to ask you to guess because that would have been my guess. And, and nobody in comics that I know of ever drew better than John, you know. Yes. You can draw as well, you can even draw differently, but you can't draw any better. He just Agreed, awesome. agreed. We all Agreed. said that when Hal Foster retires, he's the guy that should draw Prince Valiant because he could draw him just as well, but with guts, you know, more guts. <laughs> but never got the chance, but he would have been good. Uh, and uh, also in that same vein, well, Barry started off, you know, okay and got to be just wonderful. We had a wonderful relationship up to the time he quit and no kind of good relationship since he quit, you know. Oh, you're but, kidding. Uh, oh, no. no, no. Well, sometimes we got along a little bit. But uh, no, he just feels that he did everything. Everything good in Conan was, we know no other artist ever had that viewpoint about his writer. But, uh, yeah. uh, but anyway, but, you know, so I, I respect Barry's uh, art, but I, I've never got any impression he respected uh, my writing or what I brought to Conan. But that's his foolishness, not mine. Well, well that's fascinating to me. <laughs> that's fascinating to me. By the way, you're right. It correlates, with, it brings up that whole issue writer versus artists who's mm -hmm. the true collaborator and in your case as in the other case you went on with John Buscema to to establish Conan I mean if it, it you actually sold it better under Buscema. it sold very well by the end of Barry's work because he was doing fantastic work it's you know the the most iconic work of the series in a certain way but you know what within a few months Conan was uh, John Stanley. This the time Barry quit the second time. Remember, he quit, and I had to have Gil Kane do a couple of issues. Then he came back yes. and did the wonderful work, and then he quit again. And at that stage, because he'd had time to think about it, Stan called me into his, you know, we'd won awards. And, and Stan calls me into his office. He, and he says to me, point by, he says, because he was worried a little bit. Just he says, you know, that Barry had gotten so good in the book. He says, uh, now that Barry's quit Conan, probably won't be back. What do you think will happen to Conan in the, you know, as a comic? I said, I think we'll win fewer awards and sell more comic books. Oh, <laughs> he was startled. Not just you know win fewer awards, we'll sell. I think we'll actually sell more comic books with John uh, Buscem as the artist, and we did. We it was did. A great yeah, success, absolutely. and Barry could have stayed on it and done a thousand issues, as far as I was concerned. But it sold better under John Buscema, just the same way that nobody was ever a better Spider-Man artist from the get-go because he was also co was in Steve Ditko. But the book yeah. sold better. On John Romita. I mean, but, to me, the archetypical. Arch archetype of Spider-Man is always Ditko, much as I love Ramita's artwork. I mean, to me, sure. Ramita is his best work on Captain America in the 50s. But, um, you know, but at the same time, within Ramita has such a wonderful, 
sales thing. I mean, he wasn't trying to. He'd just been drawing these pretty romance comics. So he just yes. made everything look so nice. It, he could draw action. Yes. And he could draw pretty stuff. So he yes. attracted people who might have been turned off by that awkwardness in Ditko, good as it was, you know. And uh, so they put him, Stan put him on Daredevil immediately within a couple of issues. Daredevil, it had a smaller print run, of course, but it became the highest percentage sales of any Marvel comic under Romero. Wow. So then he wow. puts it on Spider Man, and Spider Man within six months, what has been the number two selling Marvel comic becomes the number one selling Marvel comic, you know, uh, wow. and everything. So, I mean, Romero just had the golden touch and he was. Wonderful, but of course he was he was really just trying to ghost what he remember uh, felt of Ditko, except that he couldn't do it because he had a whole different style. Nobody was Ditko. Nobody was. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you could be a, you could be more easily be a Ramita who has a general style, but you know, yeah. you, nobody could quite imitate. Ditko. Some people could have come closer. Gil Kane sort of tried, but you know, he had his own style too. Nobody ever did a thing, and you said, "Oh, that's Ditko back on Spider Man." Did anybody ever think that about anybody? I don't think. No, so. absolutely not. Absolutely. Yeah. Later on, Ron Friends tried to emulate Ditko a little yeah. bit, and uh, he did Kirby work. too. <laughs> and he did. He also did a good curvy as yeah, well. He also did a, good, yeah. You know, I, Conan was. I, I absolutely love your work on Conan, and okay. I love both collaboration with Barry Windsor Smith and John Buscema. So did I. So did I. And did, 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 did you? <laughs> Especially those. Uh, so how did it work with Conan? Did you just translate the novels, or did you? write new stories for Conan. How, how did well, no, you approach no. Conan? When we originally made a little contract, you know, uh, with Glenn Lord, the agent for the estate to do Conan, we didn't even have the right to do any stories. We only had the right to character. We had no right to any stories. So the first issue is just a whole new story. Wow. And the second issue, by that, uh, by the second issue, I, uh, I took an, uh, an essay. There's an essay called The Hyborian Age that Howard wrote as kind of a background to the Conan series. Conan's not even mentioned in it, but it's about uh, like a 20, 30,000 year, 40,000 year history of the world through cataclysms and things and that. The Hyborian age is somewhere in the middle of it, the, the age that Conan was a part of. And there was one phrase in there, there was one paragraph in there about some, some sort of apes in the North who were supposed to be evolving into men or something. And that they wow. had sent and a, an expedition from one of these tribes in the North went North to, to hunt them down or whatever and was never seen again. So I took that little paragraph and I made that the second issue in which they've made slaves out of these humans and yes. you know and, and the uh, the apes have kind of now barry that's interesting barry does a wonderful job but i had had in mind they were still these primitive like ape like they were man ape type characters with you know and maybe had a few accoutrements you know a sword and so forth but they were more you know barry took them and turned them into a sort of an early planet of the apes thing he makes them you know a little more like humans in a way but and I didn't that wasn't the approach that I really wanted but again it had been drawn I can't have him redraw everything and it worked okay and, and everything and and the, and the drawing was so much better and the control of the story was so much better than number one and actually that then that got nominated for the um, you know the uh, professional award that year in that issue but anyway so and so Barry was every issue was getting better but we didn't and then so then what I did is I got permission from, uh, I don't remember how it happened. Somehow I got permission to offer a little extra money per issue to the estate if we adapted an actual story. But each time I had to write a letter to the to saying, can we adapt Tower of the Elephant? Can we adapt this? Can we do this? And Glenn got so, the agent got so enthusiastic, he started sending me stuff that had never been published, including a few Conan synopses. They've you know, been published oh, now. Wow. But, but, and the synopses that the camp had turned into something we couldn't adapt the camp's Conan story, but we could adapt the synopsis that Howard had written, which is more fun anyway. Yeah. So the issue, like like issue number eight, uh, is uh, uh, with 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 these skeletons in armor in this lost city. Yes. Yes. And uh, and everything that Barry and I did. Uh, that's that originally exists as just like a one page synopsis. Wow. By uh, by by Howard. So I took that, you know, and just didn't pay attention to the the camp story the, the camp carter story because we didn't have priest to adapt it so i paid no attention to that i just took that i had a right to make a new story out of it it talks about the guardian of the city they have to attack well the camp i don't remember what the camp had made it a worm thing or so gary turned uh, uh, barry turned it to a gigantic gila monster with every scale drawn just look <laughs> you know and uh uh, and you know, and but it had these other guardians with, that we made the skeletons in armor. Barry just did a wonderful job with it, and, and eventually the the first and of course we start. I started adapting, starting with issue three, though it had originally been intended to be number five. We took a story that wasn't a Conan story, 
and we turned it into a Conan story because Howard wrote all these stories that if you change them a little bit, they could have been Conan stories. You take out the guns, you know, you, you do this, you do that, and you can make it into a Conan story. And DeCamp had been doing that in prose. So I just said, well, I can do that in the comics. And I did a lot more of it. I took anything I could gather of his, except, you know, uh, I didn't do it to Call or Solomon Kane or, but, you know, he had a lot of stories that didn't have heroes or they had a one-time hero. And I took them and turned them into uh, Conan stories with John. I'd send him, I'd just send him the original story and say, you know, turn this into a Conan story. And I made a couple of suggestions and John would, you know, or Barry before, they would just do it. In the early days, I'd, when I sent him Tower of the Elephant, the first story we adapted, which is my favorite Conan story of all time, Barry had the original story by Howard, and he had what was a three or four pages of notes, a whole synopsis by me too on what to do. Eventually, though, I would just send the synopsis and, you know, talk to the person, you know, I mean, they knew what to do. Barry knew what to do. John Buscema knew what to do. I didn't have to tell them <laughs> that much, you know. Once it, they did a few the of issues, they knew, and I trusted their instincts, and 99% of the time, they were right. It's the same process that happened with Stan Lee, in other words, you know what I mean? The mm -hmm. more you trusted the artists and the creators, the more yeah. you let them do, yeah. and the, the yeah. less you ended up doing. Yeah, and the thing uh, how did that, you feel? Go ahead. I'm sorry, I forget, forgive me. How did you, by the way, Kevin, you better jump in because I'm so excited <laughs> to talk to you. <laughs> well, um, I, have, I'm sorry, I have one more, Is he still I have here? one more He's question. Still here. One, oh, one yeah, yeah, I've, I've been you, listening and soaking it in. I know, we see you, I can you, see you. You could, you could ask the next few questions. The last question I would ask on this subject is, how did you feel about the movies and the, the, the interpretation? So you're going from novels to comics to movies. Did, did you have any thoughts about that? What did you think about Alden Schwarzenegger? Well, mostly, I, mostly I liked them. Obviously, I'd do some things different. Everybody would, you know. Yes. Uh, there are a few things I, I wouldn't like and this and that. I can't even think of most of them. But mostly, whether with Stan's characters and Jack's and so, so forth, or with, uh, or with mine, uh, even before Marvel Studios, even with the Spider-Man, the X-Men, they were pretty good choices. You know, I, sometimes I found the X-Men stories, the X-Men movies, the first two or three, a little confusing as to plot. But then I found Chris Claremont's stories confusing as to plot. But the readers had loved them. Yes. You know, I, I respected them and so forth. And they, his, Chris was doing such wonderful things with characterization and bringing women in and this and that. And the movies picked that up. And, you know, so, and, you know. Uh, they weren't doing it for me. So if there was something that I would have done differently, well, I'm not going to argue with Chris Claremont, the guy who made the real hit out of, you know, along with Tackle and Burn, but still made the hit out of the uh, X-Men. I'm not going to second guess them. When, when you talk about characters of stands, I had a more, you know, maybe a more personal attach to it, and certainly my own, but whether it was the Vision or an Ultron, who I think were, you know, wonderfully conceived, recon and they, at least they kept the main thing. They kept the idea that you have this robot villain and he creates an android, and, and who turns against him. They kept that main part. If they had used Percy by Shelley's uh, Ozymandias, <laughs> Ozymandias poem at the end, I would have been happier. But other than, but I don't, yes, but other than that, yes. I thought it was wonderful. And the same thing is true with, every, with most of the things I've seen. Sometimes these characters get changed so much, whether it's, you know, Valkyrie and a few of them that, that you'll hardly recognize them, but that's okay, you know, because they weren't, you know, you, can, you, you can't, they, see the movies and, and Stanley had exactly opposite approaches and, and ob ab absolutely opposite problems. Stan Lee started with practically nothing. He, he does Fantastic Four. Then he does Spider-Man and Thor and Ant-Man. He you know, gradually builds it up. Starts out yeah. with one book, makes it two. And, and over the period, then suddenly with new writers and artists, you make it into thousands. Slowly accreting like levels of Troy or something like that. You know. Now, yes. when, when uh, anybody, but especially Kevin Feige and the, the Marvel Studios people, when they come along, they have exactly the opposite problem. They start with the mountain. They start with this plethora of characters, thousands of them, you know, yeah. thousands of stories, practically thousands of characters, and they have to whittle it down to whatever fits. And even with Iron, just a character like Iron Man, you've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories of Iron Man. Absolutely. In the Avengers, in his own book, guest story. What do you take from that? You know, over a 20, 30 year period before, you know, a 40 year period, what do you take? What do you keep? You know, what?